evening, everyone. As usual, we take a few minutes to um, um, allow people to sign in or rather the system to take their requests to be signed in. Um, there is nothing immediate in online conference activities uh, as we have learned. Um, and uh, there is also a streaming on the YouTube channel that is being set up. Um, so we will begin very shortly once we see all the participants uh, in the conference room. Well, if everyone is comfortable, um, I, I would like to uh, begin uh, what is um, seventh day of the conference, Trade and Empire. Um, the unusual format, um, which generates a number of threads for discussion. And today we move to panel seven. Um, my name is Alexander Simonov, I'm gonna chair the panel. And we move to panel seven, which is uh, focused on agents and structures, entrepreneurship in historical uh, context. Um, uh, we have three panelists. I would like to introduce them um, individually um, as we roll into the panel. Um, I would like to remind you that, that the same format applies. Please keep uh, your presentations to a limit, a uh, 20 minute uh, limit as we agreed earlier. And uh, in the end, uh, there will be uh, um, a discussion of all three papers. The requests for questions should be sent to me via chat. Our first speaker is um, Alexander Gancharov. Uh, who uh, is an associate professor at the Department of Humanities uh, at the uh, Reshetnev Siberian State University of Science and Technology. He's also a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Applied Mathematics. Um, the interests of Dr. Gancharov are mainly in the polar history, uh, but also includes cross-disciplinary um, research, underwater archaeology, uh, applied acoustics, hydrography, uh, geographic information system, um, uh, and some others. He has publications on Severny Marskoy Put. Uh, it's a book in 2016, um, and a number of articles that uh, also focus in one way or, or another on polar history and the Northern Sea Route. And his presentation today is Commerce, Adventure, and Outrage, the Siberian Voyage of the Nimrod, 1911, and the Last of the Merchant Adventures. Please, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. Um, am I well heard, Alexander? Can yes. you hear me well? Yes, okay, so uh, thank you for the uh, elaborate presentation of myself. That, that was very nice. So, and uh, well, uh, I have this uh, presentation about and uh, report about one of uh, the episodes of the history of the Northern Sea Route. So it's kind of uh, one of the closing chapters of the uh, history during the uh, uh, pre-Soviet era, during the Tsarist era. So, and it is connected to a uh, a uh, peculiar British expedition, which was uh, not very typical of the era, and say, uh, on the other hand, it was uh, quite, uh, maybe even kind of uh, stepped out of, uh, well, quite different from all the, uh, the the other ones that we have seen. So uh, I'll uh, just uh, open the presentation um, um, I've made. So uh, uh, I hope this is right. Uh, can you see the presentation? Not yet. Oh, it's coming up. Coming up. Coming up. Yes. Okay. So, so Alexander, if you uh, if you'd be so kind, just guide me if something goes wrong. Okay. So I think we can start. Okay. So. Uh, so I titled the report Commerce, Adventure and Outrage and the uh, Siberian uh, Voyage of Nimrod in 1911 and the Last of the Merchant Adventurers. Well, 
to begin with, uh, the concept of the merchant adventures and the Northern Zero was, uh, well, uh, actually I came up with this idea. I did a, a, a recent uh, article for uh, Polar Record of uh, Cambridge University Press, and it was uh, dedicated to this person. Uh, and is the next slide visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to this man, and that is uh, Captain Joseph Wiggins of Sutherland. And Wiggins was perhaps one of the more uh, famous uh, explorers, uh, we can actually call him an explorer, or let's say seaman of the uh, Victorian era, uh, Northern Sea Route. So actually, perhaps the uh, of, of the of the whole uh, of the entire 19th century, he was the uh, kind of the more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, successful uh, mariner, he completed more voyages than anyone else. Uh, so, and uh, in uh, 1876, he uh, undertook his first voyage to the uh, Yenisei through the uh, Kara Sea Route, or what today can be uh, regarded as the western leg of the Northern Sea Route, the section of the Kara Sea and the Barents Sea from the uh, Straits of the Nova Zemla to the mouths of the uh, rivers, the Ob and the Yenisei of Western Siberia. So, and uh, he took this voyage, uh, which can be regarded as regarded as perhaps the uh, first commercial voyage because uh, others were more, let's say, voyages of exploration. Of course, this one incorporated the same. So this had a degree of exploration as well, but uh, it has been demonstrated and uh, in uh, literature that uh, this was a specifically commercial voyage. Now, the interesting thing about Wiggins was that he wasn't really a commercial person. Uh, because, well, if we study his expeditions, uh, they were, uh, well, they, uh, from the point of view of uh, entrepreneurship, they were, uh, well, they were failures, and he was a failure himself. He was an excellent mariner, uh, a total failure as a businessman, uh, but uh, uh, what I did in my article was I kind of studied him because there was a, a recent article, uh, uh, not very recent, three years ago, uh, by uh, David uh, Sanders in uh, Polar Record as well, and it compared Wiggins and uh, Admiral Makarov, and it was like Wiggins was uh, this commercial man backed by capitalists interested in uh, the free market, etc. cetera, uh, and Makarov was a representative of Russian protectionism, et cetera, so and, and it kind of studied the two. Uh, well, what I did was actually I uh, kind of what is called debunk both, and uh, neither neither was Makarov a true protectionist because he had a number of projects he was undertaking with the British, uh, or nor was uh, Wiggins uh, really a, a capitalist and a kind of interested in all of these commercial uh, commercial sites. But so that makes him. Uh, I put him in this very kind of uh, interesting category of the merchant adventurer. So if we kind of look back into history, the merchant adventurers relate to the Tudor era uh, when uh, there were these uh, men that were uh, living in the port cities of, of towns of England, and they were interested uh, uh, not only in making money and perhaps uh, going to the Spanish main and doing something with the Spanish Armada, or perhaps trying to find a north or, or north, uh, northwest or northeast passage. Uh, but they kind of uh, combined the two. Uh, so they were interested in making money, but at the same time, they were interested in the thrill of the adventure itself. So, and Wiggins, uh, in particular, I argue that he, he wasn't business, nor he was ex nor was he an explorer. He was uh, this uh, merchant adventurer. And so was this last voyage uh, to Siberia in 1911 of the last of the merchant adventurer, uh, Roland Webster. So, and again, we can get a little look of what was going on in Siberia by that point. I just I've, I've been demonstrating this a lot. So uh, uh, this one is from the brochure of the Anglo-Siberian tra uh, Trading Syndicate. So uh, published circa uh, 1890. Uh, so, and it kind of shows, reveals the whole idea, the whole concept of what trading with Siberia was. So when we have these, these towns, we have Tomsk and Yeniseisk, and then we have the, the ships and, and, and there are the rivers and there is the, there is some, kind of fur-bearing animal, an arctic fox perhaps, and there are the mammoth tusks and the, the grain and, and the gold machinery. So uh, this kind of uh, 
uh, image of uh, of what uh, the British uh, uh, trading men of the uh, late uh, 19th century of the late Victorian era were uh, thinking of Siberia when they were launching these enterprises. And so a lot of this was fabled, uh, a, a lot of this was uh, mythology to some extent, but nonetheless, they did some research. It was very vague because these companies, they uh, changed all the time and we had one company replacing another company. Uh, but nonetheless, so uh, this is uh, the stuff they published. And, and when Webster, uh, well, if we look at, uh, at Webster's biography and he relates to this excellent age called the Edwardian era, yes, and the uh, era of the age of heroic age of polar exploration. So, and, and we have Webster fitting excellent into the, uh, into the context of, of the heroic age actually. So uh, if we just, uh, a few words on Webster uh, himself. So, uh, so he was uh, born in uh, 1868, uh, and he was that uh, typical, let's say, uh, to some extent, shared a typical biography of, of many of the uh, many of the Edwardians, of the governing class people, uh, the businessmen of the Edwardian, era, not the, the upper ranks, but kind of uh, kind of the more the middle, high middle ranks. So and. Uh, his fortunes were made in the uh, in the Cylon, where he uh, was fortunate to found uh, a tea uh, a tea company which was growing Ceylon tea, and actually was acquainted with the man who we know Ceylon tea famous for today is uh, uh, actually Lipton himself. So, uh, and uh, it was said that uh, according to his own biography, that he invested something like all he had was fifty pounds into a into a business and called it the Cooperative Tea Gardens Company. Uh, so uh, in, in some while he was he managed to make enough money to actually uh, establish uh, the so-called Webster Automatic Packeting Factory in Colombo, uh, which besides he was producing coffee, uh, rubber, spices, all of the kind of uh, Indian commodities. Uh, but at the same time, Webster, uh, like other uh, young men of his generation, is interested in action. And uh, he, with the outbreak of the second uh, of the Second War in the in the Sudan, in the British Sudan, he uh, enlists as a a war journalist and takes part uh, in this uh, in this campaign. Uh, at some time, at some time, he actually kind of uh, neglects his journalistic duties and actually takes up action. Later, he takes part in the Second Boer War, um, and uh, and this kind of gives a, an, a, a, us a kind of an insight of uh, Webster himself. So why is he doing this? Uh, and uh, so. Uh, if we look at the time, so one of the, uh, the, the, the Edwardian era, the, the period of the Edwardian era is uh, besides uh, when the Boer War ends, actually there is no action going on and not very much places to go and to make distinguish yourself. But uh, he uh, actually uh, uh, decides that uh, he would like to make himself a name in one of the uh, exploration, uh, uh, one of the expeditions, uh, the exploration missions of the uh, uh, British Empire at the time. So uh, he actually wants to take part in an Antarctic expedition, but he is turned down. Uh, so he looks north, and at some point, at some point, he encounters this man, and this is Jonas Lee, the famous Norwegian entrepreneur and the one of those uh, people very famous and associated with the Northern Theater. Uh, and uh, he meets this person who is himself is uh, actually uh, engaged uh, into this Siberian business by Alfred Berry of the uh, famous uh, department store in London, uh, who gives him a book. And the book was written by none else than Joseph Wiggins. Uh, I'm sorry, not Joseph, his biography about Joseph Wiggins. So, uh, and he is enthralled. So both Lead and uh, Webster are enthralled by this magnificent man, this merchant adventurer. Why not try? So, uh, and at some point, they uh, agree on establishing a, a, a common business, but uh, then they uh, 
kind of go apart and the leads goes his own way working with dairy and webster kind of tries doing everything by himself so what he does he he gets the ship, the Nimrod, and the Nimrod was just returned from the Ar uh, Antarctic and was uh, took part in Shackleton's famous expedition. So, and he attempts to take the Kara or the Northern Theater to the NSA. So he knows little of the NSA itself. He knows little of Siberia. He knows little of the Arctic. So, oh, basically, what he does, he has something like a map like this. He has uh, Wiggins's book. Book. He has uh, all of the kind of information from the newspapers. So, and he just uh, undertakes this excellent, magnificent voyage uh, aboard the uh, polar vessel, the Nimrod, which is suitable for the task because it's been in the Antarctic and winter overwintered in the Antarctic, so it can be used. Uh, but uh, being a commercial uh, expedition, he kind of gets the big idea of bringing Thailand tea to Siberia. That's kind of an excellent idea. Why not try it? So, uh, so that's what he does. Uh, well, besides tea, he brings a lot of uh, brings uh, lots of different stuff. For example, he has a car on board which he intends to drive from somewhere from the mouth of the NSA to Yenisei itself, so quite uh, awkward. Uh, then he, uh, uh, the next thing he uh, tries to do is, which he doesn't mention of in the newspapers, uh, in, in his later interviews, is he takes aboard a lot of, uh, uh, a number of boxes of ammunition and firearms. Uh, uh, what he fails to recognize is that the, uh, there have been expeditions to the Siberian Arctic, and he's not the first one coming into the Siberian Arctic. Uh, and uh, he fails to recognize that uh, just by coming in and bringing in certain goods, especially weapons, uh, he's going to have problems with the Russian law. Uh, but he fails to recognize this. He arrives at the place called uh, Golchiha on the... Uh, on the uh, in in the mouth of the NSA, well, basically where the NSA ends and the the Gulf of the NSA begins about this part. Actually, he claims to have been making a number of discoveries, which were on the map, even on the map that uh, has been here. For example, Sopochnaya Karga, just a, a north of Golshiha, so in the Webster claims that he's been discoverer for some reason. But nonetheless, he comes here. He uh, uh, There are a number of Russian river, river iron steamers. He has a transshipment. Uh, he claims that he has a permit to do some kind of trading uh, uh, from the government, from the Russian government. And he takes the boat downriver, upriver, I'm sorry, arriving at Krasnoyarsk sooner or later. Uh, when the authorities, actually the authorities are notified in Dudinka by the time, because there was a telegraph line with Dudinka in Krasnoyarsk, uh, that there is this uh, Englishman. Well, uh, he is confused. He's called an American. He's called an Englishman. Uh, his uh, uh, name is confused. Uh, but uh, it, it is recalled in the archives that he is a British or American cavalry captain uh, by the name of Webster. And he has been bringing a number of of, uh, boxes of ammunition with himself. So, and uh, he arrives uh, at Krasnoyarsk where he is to his surprise arrested. Uh, actually at NSA he's arrested. Then he, he, he comes to Krasnoyarsk where he is detained. So, and we have this uh, wonderful image from uh, the uh, Palm Oil Gazette of the time uh, showing that uh, this, uh, and, and, and the, the, the public outrage was just uh, enormous that the, a British explorer reading the British uh, expedition to Central Siberia has been arrested in Krasnoyarsk by the uh, uh, by the Tsarist regime uh, police because because he's been doing this uh, good thing he's been trying to open commerce with Siberia and no offense but uh, all of the publications fail to mention that he did two interesting things first of all he brought in the guns and he just on route, he was selling the guns to, and, and the archival material show that uh, uh, the Russian authorities were uh, after the exp after uh, uh, Webster's expedition. They were uh, going up and down the river trying to uh, uh, collect all of these weapons and uh, to uh, confiscate them. Uh, and uh, the second thing he does is there are uh, two Russian political or three actually Russian political exiles uh, which were living uh, in the vicinity of Golshikhovo. They boarded Nimrod and left for, uh, departed for Europe. 
and uh, that was another excellent violation. So uh, actually what uh, saved uh, Webster from further persecution because actually the matter was uh, uh, very, uh, well, it was uh, kind of reduced uh, very quickly. Well, first of all, he paid the uh, all of the duties he was supposed to pay, plus uh, a number of fines. Well, as we've said, he's been a he wasn't a poor man. He had a number of uh, tea plantations and facilities in Ceylon. Uh, but uh, plus the uh, uh, the diplomatic relations between England and uh, Russia at the time were kind of Russia was trying to be more friendly with British Empire. So uh, nobody wanted this diplomatic kind of event going on in, in the heart of Siberia. But one of the Siberians who stood up to the defense of uh, Webster was uh, Stepan Vostroten. Uh, here is shown with Wiggins in, uh, after their uh, honeymoon voyage across the northern sea route uh, with his wife. Uh, so, and Stepan Vostrotin was a representative of the uh, so called, that was a kind of a uh, well, he wasn't uh, specifically an obelisk, so one of the uh, uh, people who were kind of uh, fighting for uh, Siberian independence or autonomy, but he was close. And so, uh, one of the uh, he wrote a number of political uh, economic and social political pamphlets on the Northern Sea Route, particularly after the uh, so-called free port. There was this uh, period of when uh, a, a number of goods could be delivered uh, into Siberia without paying a duty. So, and uh, after it was closed in uh, 18, uh, uh, 1898, so Vostrotin launched this infamous camp campaign uh, in the Siberian press. He wrote a number of pamphlets uh, describing that uh, Siberia needs the Northern Sea Route in order for its development. Uh, the uh, the Trans-Siberian Railway does not help because it's, it it's more to maintain uh, connections with the uh, Far East uh, and uh, actually uh, is kind of a yoke around Siberia, uh, pulling it closer to the uh, manufacturing capitalists of uh, central Russia. Uh, as for the Northern Sea it is a direct outlet into uh, uh, Western Europe, and of course, uh, this is uh, what uh, Vostrotin kind of longers on, and he can, continues uh, stating this position uh, again and again in his And uh, in 1911, he also launches his personal campaign, and which he uh, calls the uh, impermeable barriers of the Northern Sea and uh, links Wiggins and Webster into one chain showing that these people were trying to do something good and uh, they failed because of the Russian government. Well, uh, as we've seen, uh, they failed not because of the Russian government, but because we're merely they were adventurers to some extent and less they were commercial men. So uh, unfortunately uh, for uh, Webster, he had a number of plans uh, which uh, would not uh, come to be. Uh, uh, in uh, this is actually his grave in 1915 he died at a rather young age so and even though he had a number of projects uh, which uh, then uh, later uh, Jonas Lead uh, shown here uh, would use in his uh, scheme of the uh, Kara Siru. okay so uh, I hope that was uh, about 20 minutes uh, I'm kind of looking at the watch all the time so and uh, thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer any questions or take part in the discussion thank you thank you very much um, uh, the um, discussion will happen at the end of the panel so first of all we, we go through um, three papers uh, and we move to the next presenter uh, in the panel, according to the program, um, Alexander Turbin, um, who is completing his PhD dissertation at the Department of History at the HSC University in St. Petersburg, and is also a junior um, research fellow at the Center for Historical um, Research. Um, Alexander Turbin's interests are in um, seaports, history of the global connections uh, of the trade and the seaports, history of um, the economic uh, policies, and also history of citizenship and subjecthood. And uh, even though the dissertation is not yet there, he has already published two articles, one on Arsenyev to be 
uh, out with uh, Sibirica, Interdisciplinary Journal of Siberian Studies, and the other is at, on, in Ab Imperio um, on the Freeport regime in the Far East. And uh, the topic of his presentation um, is uh, between welcome, welcomed foreigners with capitals and dangerous exploiters of the Russians, practices and discourses of inclusion and exclusion of foreign merchants in the Russian Far East in 1880s, 1910s. Alexander, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone, do you hear me? Great. So, and do you see the presentation now? Fine. Uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, I appreciate an opportunity to deliver my speech today, and I probably should thank everyone who made it real. Um, but uh, I think I shall start uh, from a brief introduction of my general research. So in my PhD thesis, I examined discourses about, uh, discussions about Puerto Franco uh, regime in the Russian Far East. Uh, as it was already introduced at the first day of the conference by Sergei Glebov, Puerto Franco was a local set of regulations uh, according to which in the region existed almost unlimited free trade zone. It actually existed up to the lake of Baikal, and you might see it on the map. But I mostly concentrate on the Amur province, a place where uh, most intense discussions took place. Um, you might see on the map several uh, important cities, uh, such as Nikolaevsk. Uh, Vladivostok, which later became the naval main naval base on the Pacific, and Khabarovsk, a place where uh, regional administration uh, resided from 1884. And like concerning the time, uh, I concentrate on the second part of 19th, beginning of 20th century. So, uh, most researchers who studied Puerto Franco focused on the regulatory measures and economic dimension on, on the, of this phenomenon. Uh, but I'm interested at how different ideologies or political visions collided and interacted uh, with each other in the debates about the Far East in Puerto Franco. Uh, while the central uh, bureaucracy, uh, this issue was not that important for the local administration uh, and society, it was. Uh, but when it came to debating about Puerto Franco, it was not just about simple calculations, but about a wide range of topics, such as resettlement, imperial expansion in the region, and like the, the essence of the Russian trade and power itself. <clears throat> From the very initial, I was struck by how diverse were the opinions and argumentations about Puerto Franco, and also by how complicated it is to frame all of these positions in the framework of one, for example, abstract economic rationality. Vice versa, it appeared that uh, historical actors posed the arguments as rational and pragmatic, but they did not necessarily do this in the same logic as their counterparts. They rather offered alternative coordinate systems in which Puerto Franca appeared as good or dangerous. Uh, thus, in general, I argued that through these debates, we can look at different visions of empire in its population uh, and uh, the future development of the region. In my overall research, I look at uh, uh, what I prefer to call the boundary of political belonging the configuration of how self and others were understood, both in uh, specialized categories, such as colony, metropole, or national state, uh, as well as uh, group categories derived from subjecthood, estate, national, or racial logics. On the next slide is about historiography, but I shall probably skip it to save some time. Uh, then, Mm, in this particular paper, I decided to make a closer look at the positions of so-called European merchants in the Far East. Uh, particularly, I was interested at how they uh, were included in the local affairs and what effect did it have on the debates about Far East and Puerto Franca. 
Uh, here in the uh, on the slide and in the article, I put a disclaimer explaining what I imply in my paper when saying European, uh, whom we are talking about, and uh, how many people are those. Actually, in comparison to other foreigners, it was a very limited number of people, many of whom were so quite influential. <clears throat> In his uh, presentation, uh, Sergei Glebov showed us such people as Julius Brinner and Adolf Dutton. And uh, as you might see uh, in, in my paper, I pay much attention to Adolf Dutton and uh, Kunst and Dalbert's trading house. And on the slide, you might see two photos. Uh, I included them into in, in the presentation just to help you to get an impression in what sort of context uh, everything is taking place. And like next two slides, uh, they actually show how the company's main building in Vladivostok was changing. The first one and the second one. So, but apart from the main buildings, there was a big number of uh, uh, stores all around the Far East and uh, in some periods in Manchuria and Kwantun. <clears throat> Uh, in this paper, in general, I decided to pay that much attention to this trading house for several reasons. First, there is a good historiography on this company. And uh, second, the story of this company was taken by Eric Lohr in one of his earlier books to show how the First World War uh, uh, how stimulated uh, rapid changes in uh, how the boundary of imperial citizenship worked. Uh, by presenting my article, I wanted to look at the story vice versa as an example of continuous practices of inclusion and exclusion that took place in the Russian Far East in regard to foreigners. <clears throat> Next slide. So the paper is structured in three parts, and I shall make several remarks of, on each of them. In the first part, I look at the period of uh, 1860s and 70s. Uh, this uh, uh, part is partly based on my previous paper in, in the Urban Period Journal, in which I tried to show that even in uh, the creation of the Far Eastern port of Ranka might be seen as a part of the liberal political project of the reform-minded nationalists. The interesting peculiarity of this project was that it, it was quite loyal to the foreign trade and foreign merchants since their presence in the region should have ensured proper colonization by the Russians and also facilitated Russian presence in the economic activities in the overall region, thus giving prospects for future development of the empire in, on the Pacific. And surprisingly, on the contrary, Siberian merchants in this story were rather unfavored uh, due to alleged harm they could make to the regional development uh, by bringing various corruptive practices that were widespread in Siberia. And I do not mention a uh, quite common trope of Siberian separatism. <clears throat> Next. So uh, the main point uh, I tried to show in the first part is that uh, from the legal perspective, Amur was a place where economic activities were liberalized even more than at the rest of the empire during the great reforms. Both Russian subjects and foreigners were placed in quite equal competitive posi positions under the rules for the settlement of Russians and foreigners in the Amur and Primorsky regions that were enacted in 1861. Uh, however, it seems that these rules were quite rarely applied to Russians in comparison to foreigners. Uh, on this slide, you might see a quotation uh, from the newspaper in 1884. At uh, that time, there was uh, a discussion on the prolongation of the privileges. <clears throat> Here is another quotation. Uh, sure, there are from 1880s, so they are indirectly telling us about those practices, but even, even those who supported foreign trade, for example, Adolf Dutton himself in his book, generally accepted the fact that uh, practical regulation of economic activities sometimes favored foreigners. Uh, many claim this to be an intentional favoring, uh, some suppose it to be accidental one. Uh, but in, in the first part, I also add another layer, uh, the self-government. Um, 
in the rest of the empire, for uh, like unlike in the rest of the empire, uh, in the Russian Far East, foreigners uh, for some time were included into the practices of local self-government, is that even without changing uh, subjecthood. Temporary rules approved by the Eastern Siberian uh, Governor General in 1868 allowed this participation. And as historiography shows, foreigners were much desired uh, by the local, uh, in, in the local self-government by the administration. Some of the foreigners even used to be city mayors. For example, Friedrich Luder, Luderf, whom I uh, quote in the beginning of the article, he used to be one in Nikolaevsk in uh, mid 1860s. These examples all together show the early local specific of inclusion ex and exclusion uh, uh, practices in the Far East that protected the discussion, discussions in 1880s. Next slide. <clears throat> so, uh, the second part of the paper analyzes period from the creation of the Premier General Governorship in 1884 up to the 1890s. Uh, this is an important period for my general research, as in 1880s, the first big public discussion appeared. It is not an accident, because uh, with the creation of the General Governorship, a big campaign on the exploration of the region took place so-called Khabarovsk Congresses, uh, meetings of local experts, first were organized uh, as soon as uh, General Governor Korf came to the region. And in the second part of the paper, I mostly look at the discussions about foreigners that took uh, uh, part in the first Congress and especially in the newspaper Vladivostok, uh, the only newspaper, uh, only newspaper of the city that was uh, uh, recently established. First of all, I put the whole debates in the context of two big discourses uh, that, as I think, largely influenced uh, uh, local discussions. The first one is nationalistic discourse. Uh, we can trace nationalistic rhetoric right in general governors' own speeches, uh, but I also look at the Moskovsky Vedomosti newspaper. Uh, some articles from this newspaper triggered harsh discussions. Uh, in the local press, uh, thus, uh, we might see that locals were much aware about the importance of nationalistic arguments and, uh, depending on their positions, instrumentalized or opposed them. Uh, another important discourse which I take is Siberian regionalists one. Uh, this was another mighty language to describe local affairs in another way, uh, as relations between metropole and colony. Regionalists newspaper Vostochnaya Bazrenia was one of the most popular in Vladivostok, and they also paid much attention to the issues of Porto Franco and foreigners. <clears throat> so uh, I try to show in the second part that local actors could build up their rhetoric using a wide range of tactics, starting from instrumentalization of alternative languages to attempts to redefine key categories. One of those examples you might see on the slide. In this quotation, uh, also try to show the ambiguity of ethnic approach to Russianness, uh, as well as senselessness of uh, attempts to substitute foreign merchants with Russian ones. Next slide uh, shows another quotation in which the notion of the Russian market is debated. Uh, so the whole debate largely was structured through various redefinitions and borrowings from different discourses. Uh, as I show up, I'll try to show up uh, in the very end of the second part, even general governor himself, despite delivering quite nationalistic speeches about region being an integral part of the metropole, actually he did it on public, but uh, in, uh, uh, he, he simultaneously protected local Porto Franca uh, before central authorities using the rhetoric which uh, uh, much more common for Siberian regionalists. Okay, next slide. Uh, I also pay substantial attention uh, to the issue of racial hierarchies built up in, in these discussions, but like since this issue was well covered in previous day by Sergei Glebov, and since I'm limited in time, I would like just to mention that in my work I also see big importance of uh, rationalized visions and how they were imposed on, on the local populations. For example, here. 
uh, here, uh, first of all, Europeans uh, very much more included in the production of the local expertise. And second, racial rhetoric served as good alternative to nationalistic one when it came to explaining why foreign merchants were not a threat. If juxtaposed to Chinese or to the yellow race, they could be described as allies. And uh, here on the slide, you might see a quotation from uh, Adolf's Dutton books of 1897. <clears throat> Actually, he, he also liked to compare Chinese to Jews. For example, I just refer back to the Sergei Glebov's uh, presentation at the first day. So, <clears throat> actually, uh, this story, which I just described, uh, is explored already in the third part of the text, in which I briefly highlight some points. First of all, despite Adolf Dutton change his subject to, th this was not a necessary uh, option or action. It created several possibilities, such, for example, it allowed participating in self-government uh, after it was prohibited for foreigners. And for example, uh, uh, in 1898, we even witnessed uh, a drama on the pages of newspaper uh, Vladivostok, where the active campaign against uh, local Geschäftmachers uh, took place. Some of them were clearly marked as a party of non-Russian merchants or even called Dutton's party, Dutton'ovskaya Partia. Uh, but in general, I come to the same conclusion uh, as uh, uh, Sergei Glebov in his uh, article of 2017. Uh, that uh, uh, by looking at how expertise worked in the Russian Far East, we might see that even without changing the subjecthood, it was possible to experience several rights of citizenship. And finally, in the third part, I uh, slightly touch upon uh, the story about the All Russia exhibition in Nizhny Novgorod in 1896, for which Dutton's book should have been published. I, I mean, this book quotation from which I just showed. <clears throat> so um, my reference to Yava Berar's book helps to highlight the symbolic importance of the event and thus uh, the importance of the fact that the uh, regional administration authorized Dutton to prepare his book for it. Uh, for sure, he, he was a local expert uh, on the economic issues, but also he was an ex-foreign subject and like, if to come back to overall idea of the article, I tried to show uh, that uh, uh, it didn't became a problem only in 1914, as, as for example, we might think uh, when looking at Eric Lohr's uh, writings on Kunst and Albers, but actually it was a matter for consideration for the most time under the examination. Uh, thus, uh, we see a long story of questioning various borders of political belonging or citizenship subjecthood, uh, as well as like long story of inclusion and exclusion. So here on the slide, uh, main statements, which we could describe, but like so discuss, but since there will be next presenter, I think we should just proceed. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Um, and um, without any further ado, we move to the third uh, presenter uh, in our panel, Timur Valetov, who works at the Center of Economic History at the Department of Historical Information Science at the Faculty of History in uh, Lomonosov, uh, Moscow State um, University. Um, uh, Timur Valetov is the author of two published monographs. They are in Russian, but I was given only the English language CV. So one is called Not Only Rubles, Work Incentives of Russian Textile Workers Before 1917, published in Moscow, 2010, and Social and Economic Agency and the Cultural Heritage of the Soviet Past, also Moscow, 2010. He has a number of publications um, that deal with both um, economic um, history, economic statistics, and digital history. And uh, today, um, uh, Dr. Valetov will give us a presentation on the Russian Empire exports in 
1802-1915, how did the share of industrial products change? The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's nice to see you all at the, um, uh, at the panel. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, well, my, uh, my research is rather statistical than, um, than narrative. And uh, uh, I, uh, I would like to, uh, to investigate uh, the structure of uh, Russian exports uh, according to official um, exports uh, publications. Um, the source, just a minute, the source of, uh, uh, of my work is uh, um, Russian trade yearbooks, which started uh, to be published early enough in uh, the very uh, beginning of the uh, 19th century uh, with the data uh, of 1802 and uh, uh, with a short break, uh, it lasted until the uh, 1917 when uh, the volume for 1915 was published, and uh, it was the, the final volume of this serial publication. Uh, the uh, statistical yearbook uh, uh, give, uh, gives us uh, uh, much uh, detailed and different information. Uh, its structure changed. Uh, indeed over the century as uh, any uh, statistical publication uh, has the same uh, problem, but uh, it is uh, indeed possible to uh, work, uh, to, to study them. And my research question is to con construct uh, uh, the uh, data series on expert structure and uh, particularly to analyze uh, how uh, much of um, the commodities were so-called finished goods or industrial goods. Um, it is known that um, Russian exports uh, in the beginning of the 20th century was mostly surreal, Hlebny uh, export. And uh, if we look to the uh, previous uh, century, uh, 18th century, uh, Russia sold uh, much of non-food um, crude materials like uh, tar, wood, uh, ropes, uh, uh, animal fat, um, etc. It is it is a good question when and how the situation changed over the century. And uh, uh, if some uh, researchers say about this change, they usually do not say much about the uh, role of industrial experts because its role uh, uh, was not so big, but from the point of economic development, this is important, I think. The structure system uh, from the yearbook itself, it changed from, uh, from decade to another decade, but uh, mostly it, uh, the communities were divided to food supplies, crude and semi-processed materials, uh, leaf animals and finished goods. And I think it is necessary to add uh, one more category on various uh, goods like paintings, museum objects, and some goods which uh, cannot be sorted, uh, things by passengers, etc. Um, this structure system has some disputable um, definitions, and uh, it is very important to say that some of them changed from 
one decay to another. Uh, for example, uh, hop is uh, a product um, necessary only for brewing, and uh, it should naturally be um, counted with the food supplies, but uh, the publishers themselves, they, uh, they changed uh, its position from the food supplies to uh, raw materials and uh, again to food supplies. And this is not the only example um, I can give many uh, of them. Uh, but the fact is that if we think to construct the data series, it is mainly possible to uh, to produce for all of the periods period of uh, of the public of the yearbook publication. Um, strange enough, nobody has constructed these data series before, and uh, mainly it is because the task is uh, tough before computers, or if you have uh, no uh, statistical departments. Uh, so now uh, much of the data are presented at our uh, faculty website and uh, you have my contacts and so uh, if you need uh, any data I can send you. Well, basic classification is the classification of the source itself. Uh, its primary uh, level material sh shows, well, I I need to say I have uh, two uh, kinds of um, of pictures. Uh, first graph is uh, the structure, uh, the dynamics of the percentage uh, within the total export value, uh, and the sum is uh, hundred percent. And another one is. Uh, uh, the dynamics in uh, the comparable rubles of 1913. And well, we see that uh, Russian export was uh, mostly uh, consisted of uh, raw materials. Uh, and we see the change between yellow non food materials and green food materials, which uh, we see is, uh, has been processed in the 1860s and the 1870s. The role of so-called finished goods uh, was not very big and uh, it lasted from about 10% um, until the, uh, 1870s, then five to seven percent, not too much. But if we see uh, its export in rubles, we see that even after the 1870s, its uh, uh, its sort of value grows uh, slightly uh, while the industrialization uh, is coming. Uh, we, we better see the export structure of different categories of this. Uh, first is food supply categories, uh, which uh, the graph shows that uh, uh, Russian food supplies exports was mainly surreal export. And only during the industrialization, we see uh, growing uh, values of uh, eggs, butter, and sugar. Uh, and uh, uh, if we see the absolute values, we find three periods of uh, of big growth, which is known as the literature. And uh, uh, the first and the third periods of this growth um, mostly related to the world market uh, 
um, realities. And uh, I think that the period of the 1870s is mostly related to uh, Russian internal um, economic development uh, and uh, especially in transport development. This is the map of railways in Russia in 1865 and uh, in 10 years it uh, developed very much with many points of crossing uh, western border and uh, big uh, amount of uh, different uh, products and, uh, of, uh, of grain and uh, different raw materials could uh, go to, uh, to Europe. This is the period of uh, very big uh, rapid growth in, uh, in the exports. If we see the raw materials export structure, uh, it is more complicated structure and we also see uh, big shifts in the 1870s. And if we see the absolute values, we see that uh, uh, raw materials also experienced big growth. But later, when industrialization, Russian industrialization started, uh, its um, export, export of the industrial raw material, crude materials, uh, didn't, uh, didn't grow. And the export of cereals continued to grow. So this is why we see that shift between the, um, the big, uh, groups. Well, uh, if we see the finished goods uh, actual structure, we see it was mostly textile uh, exports before the industrialization and it, um, it stayed more complicated uh, in the last uh, period of industrialization. Uh, well, uh, uh, the textile exports in absolute values uh, grew um, slightly during the first half of the century. And in the uh, 18, uh, 1860s, it, it, uh, uh, it, it, it dropped much and later it again started to grow and this drop is related to the annexation of Middle Asia. Um, Middle Asia Khanats were the uh, states who uh, bought Russian textiles mainly. And uh, this peak is the short period when uh, part of the Middle Asia was uh, uh, conquered already, but not uh, joined administratively into the custom border uh, of Russia. So the trade after the annexation of uh, uh, the Middle Asia, the trade itself started to grow, uh, to grow very rapidly, but it stopped to be the foreign trade. Well, um, however, uh, this basic structure is not very good to understand the economic development of the country. Uh, it, is, uh, it is rather good for imports. We analyze purpose of using the, uh, the products and uh, from the point of economic development, there is maybe more difference between rice and rye than between rye and uh, flax. So it is possible to recalculate all the economic, uh, uh, the uh, export structure. And uh, I would like to show another system of, uh, of uh, classification of the export commodities to the products of agriculture. 
and natural resources and the products of agriculture, both these groups uh, are divided into crude materials and processed materials with, uh, well, low level factories uh, like mills or maybe small factories. And uh, as for agriculture, uh, you see, some, well, while grain is the crude material, uh, flour is the processed material, honey is crude material, and sugar is processed material. And uh, um, as for the category of, of the finished goods, it stayed the same like at the previous um, uh, classification. The same with natural resources. Ores, for example, would be crude materials, but it is necessary to build the plant to produce metals. So this is, well, not maybe industrial, but, uh, but processed uh, products, processed commodities, uh, which can be um, valid as industrial uh, products for the, uh, the national economy. Well, uh, this kind of graphs is uh, not very, uh, very interesting. I think it shows that uh, agriculture, uh, the, the Russian exports uh, was uh, mostly agricultural, but uh, let better see uh, the uh, graph of percentages of total exports. And um, uh, we see crude agriculture, um, dark green is processed materials, gray, light gray is natural crude materials, and uh, dark gray is natural processed materials. We can shift the categories and to see what uh, role of industrial exports in a broader sense uh, may be valid uh, as a percentage of uh, the total export. And uh, it is uh, more notable uh, part of the, of the export from, from 40 to, well, maybe, 15 percent and uh, if we see its industrial uh, this group this joint um, group uh, internal structure we see that uh, this period of the 1870s is also the period when um, uh, the structure of exports uh, changed dramatically from one uh, source of, uh, of products to another new source of products. Uh, the first half of the century was uh, an epoch of animal fat, for example, which uh, declined, declines later when the technological progress made it not, uh, not necessary for the world market. But uh, since the industrialization started, uh, chemical production became uh, much more uh, important and, uh, and food production, butter, sugar, flour, and um, wooden materials, and uh, different other types of materials. So and we have just one yeah, minute yeah, left. Yeah, I'm finishing. Could you, could you yeah. go to conclusions to wrap up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my conclusion is actually that uh, the period of the uh, 1860s and the 89, uh, 1870s is the crucial period uh, from the point of view uh, both of uh, 
crude materials and the industrial exports structure in Russia. Thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you. Um, um, and we uh, now move to the um, um, discussion that is opened up by the discussant at the panel. Today, it is Sergei Glebov, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I'll try to be brief um, and um, uh, put together a couple of points about this uh, three fascinating papers um, so that we can have a bit more time for the discussion. Um, I'll start with Alexander Gencherov's paper. Alexander tells the story of a British traveler, merchant and adventurer, Roland Valentine Webster, uh, who conducted a somewhat comical um, expedition to Siberia via the Kara Sea route uh, in 1912. Given Webster's sort of tendency for self-aggrandizing and, and seeming unawareness of uh, local conditions and the degree of state presence in Siberia, his affair appears to be somewhat akin to the one um, performed by Georg Schaeffer in Hawaii in a century earlier, or was it? Um, uh, Gonchirov suggests that the story is indicative of the era of uh, Edwardian seafaring exploration. I find the story interesting as a vignette, uh, but I'm struggling to see what uh, may be its larger uh, significance. Uh, uh, the story, um, what can we really learn from this story about British exploration? Because the paper actually doesn't tell us much about British attitudes to Siberian trade in the early 20th century or about the Siberians' attitude towards uh, uh, foreign merchants and, and foreign exploration. Is it really fair to take Vastrotin's reaction as representative of all Siberian reactions? Um, was there indeed any conflict in the Russian or Siberian circles uh, regarding Webster's uh, voyage. It might be uh, really useful to see a kind of a map of political affiliations and social concerns as they are refracted in the debates um, and discussions about um, Webster. And of course, Webster himself was not a rare foreign visitor in Siberia um, and not as exotic uh, for Siberians as, as one might expect. There are a few other things that, that strike me uh, just by reading this paper that might sort of serve as, as, as uh, ways to start digging out uh, more interesting uh, points and, and sort of more telling experiences. Uh, the the uh, side mentioning of the three exiles seems fascinating, um, given Cannon's uh, 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 exile in Siberia. Um, the other point that um, might be curious is I'm struggling to understand why Webster brought the rifles. Um, was that a commercial operation or um, was there any particular political plan? And of course, in general, something doesn't click in this story. Um, so that uh, there is a kind of a guy who um, apparently is very successful um, exploiter of the resources of the British Empire. He has traveled the world. Um, he runs a factory that's a productive factory um, in Colombo. And then um, in his Russian expedition, he appears to be a loony, right? He makes assumptions that um, very few educated people at the time uh, would make. I'd like to, to, to know more, more why this is the case and what are you know, some of the uh, explanatory uh, uh, points that you can make about this. But the general, the general uh, question and the general kind of um, uh, 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 point I want to make about this paper is that I'd like uh, um, us to think maybe or invite you, Alexander, to think with us um, out loud um, about uh, the, the sort of the larger questions that are um, touched upon this paper. Alexander Turbin's paper turns our attention to the role of foreign, mostly European merchants in the Russian Far East, perhaps the most articulate and, and successful settler colonial project in Imperial Russia. Uh, indeed, these foreigners, um, like the American Enoch Emery, a gold industrialist, Julius Briner, a shipping tycoon, Charles Cooper, one of the first civilian settlers um, in the Far East who realized the value of rental properties for Chinese labor, or Adolf Dutton, the German-born manager and then co-owner of the largest retail company in the region, played an outsized role in the development of the Russian Far East. And as Turbin shows, due to racial, social, cultural, and the state prejudices, they often managed to become de facto uh, citizens or subjects in Russia without 
uh, acquiring formerly legal subjects in the empire. But they were often called upon, um, or readily offered out of their own volition, expert advice um, to imperial authorities. Of course, the paradox of the, of the story that, that Turbin tells is that all this diversity revealed itself in the midst of the colonialist project, um, which was dressed increasingly in the language of nationalizing empire. So um, I would invite um, Alexander to think about the following question. If uh, the russifying language of nationalism is easy to detect in this story, those who preferred to avoid the homogenizing drive often had, to, had no ready formulas to defend their vision of political organization. They could refer to local interests, but only in terms of uh, like, you know, we are salaried officers of the empire, we need free trade in order to sustain ourselves. There is no larger political or, or uh, 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 kind of a socio-political vision uh, which we can describe as the language of empire, opposed to the language of nationalism. So um, um, uh, uh, maybe uh, we can think about um, how um, uh, kind of uh, uh, terms like Russia, fatherland, state, and all of this uh, comes from Ilya Gerasimov's article, The Great Imperial Revolution, which shows that at the moment of collapse, empire is actually invisible, right? People use the language that is not uh, a reflective of the, of the uh, imperial reality of the imperial threats. It was the language of empire was nowhere to be found. So can we try to detect in these debates about Porto Franco uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of language that tries to capture um, the pre-national, pre-imperial kind of a, a, a set of circumstances, visions, dispositions, and articulate it? Um, that would make, of course, uh, the argument about Porto Franco not an economic argument, but a language used to re-describe the imperial, the imperial space. Um, and Timur Valetov's paper presents a more traditional look at the economic history, focusing on statistical data um, on Russian exports in the course of the 19th century. It is meticulously researched, and I'm sure it required um, a, a lot of effort over a long period of time. Um, it shows that by changing the categories of statistical analysis, we can see a somewhat different picture of Russian exports. If we count butter as a product of industry rather than a processed material, rather than just agriculture, the Russian industrial export, um, uh, of course, will grow. It seems to me, though, um, and, and please correct me, uh, uh, Timur, if I'm wrong, um, uh, that uh, the outcomes of your study may be predicted with a good measure of accuracy. Maybe not the specific numbers, right? But the larger kind of outcome of, of your study may be predicted uh, before be, be the study itself. So I'd like to ask you um, to think with us um, about what are the larger implications of this change that you're proposing for understanding the long-term history of uh, the Russian economy in the 19th century. Does it alter, does it change the picture we know from the studies conducted back in the 1960s by, I don't know, people like Alexander Gershenkron, for example. Um, even with all the changes um, that, that you are suggesting, the fact remains that great export um, you know, is at the center. Uh, it's the backbone of, of Russian foreign trade to an overwhelming degree. And that after the great reforms, the share of industrially produced goods grows somewhat um, and then takes off a little bit more uh, uh, during the industrialization um, campaign. Perhaps you could map for us the larger significance of, of um, your, uh, your argument, and perhaps uh, you could relate the most important changes that one sees from, from your uh, statistical study um, and explain how they would, would sort of... Uh, help us understand better the 19th century Russian economic history. For example, this, this spike um, uh, in, in um, Russian exports of, of textiles um, in the 1860s um, is obviously related to the American Civil War, right, and the, and the collapse of the American export of cotton uh, at the time. Um, uh, and so it's probably largely determined by the global markets. Uh, but my, my sort of main uh, request for you is to help us think and, and, and see the larger implications of your research, right? Well, thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Sergey. And uh, we move um, uh, towards Q&A period. Um, um, we, we have 
uh, time uh, to respond at the end to both the, the discussants questions and commentaries. And the questions in the first on the list is David Aragai, please. Thank you. Ah, here I am. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations today. I, my question goes to uh, Alexander Gancharov, and it is about the term uh, adventurer as an, an analytical category, because I'm uh, myself stumbled up and a bit up, up uh, when I worked on Chef, or as Sergei Glebov already has pointed out, and I'm very critical on the term adventure as an analytical category. I mean, it is in the sources, but I mean, it's very problematic because it's so positivistic and it uh, does not speak about, you know, for example, the, the people who, who help those adventurers, especially like indigenous intermediaries. And it absolutely misses a reflection on, uh, on colonialism this, of course, especially in, in the case of the Pacific and probably uh, a bit in, in another circumstance in Siberia. But uh, could you probably say something about, about that? Thank you. Yes, next in line is Ilya Gerasimov. Thank you. Uh, my my question uh, in in the order of presentation, uh, my uh, uh, response to the first paper uh, builds on uh, Sergei's comments. I find uh, Alexandra's uh, story absolutely fascinating and mysterious, uh, uh, equally mysterious. Uh, but the the paper uh, presents. Uh, the, the, the main protagonist as a, a cavalry captain in search of, and I quote, in search of glory and quick profit. Uh, the problem is not only is that uh, Webster was in, in, in our terms a millionaire. Uh, to understand the, the context uh, of Edwardian era in uh, for economic history, not for general zeitgeist as proposed in the paper, uh, one thing that we should know is that uh, this was the moment when uh, Indian tea, in particular Ceylon tea, made its uh, appearance uh, of course on the British market. Uh, and uh, Webster was there, Ceylon tea. He started a very successful business. Uh, he started from exporting 60,000 uh, pounds of tea and then uh, became an owner of three major enterprises. He began exporting it to Africa. He had his moment in, in uh, South African war. And this uh, he, it, uh, army stint was under two years. It's unclear what was his participation on the battlefield, but he was severely wounded and commissioned and awarded Queen's Medal for saving us, attempting to save, save life during the hurricane, uh, not, not on the battlefield. So, uh, and uh, in during the Paris uh, exhibition in 1900, he was uh, assistant tea commissioner for the exhibition and presided over Ceylon uh, uh, Tea Pavilion. So he was the man who made uh, Ceylon Tea a thing. And to us Russians present at this conference, the idea of quality tea, uh, of, as, 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 as at least all the generation Russians, is the Indian tea uh, with an elephant on the package and Ceylon tea as the as the tea, right? But uh, this was uh, not the case in, in Russia too. Uh, and uh, as uh, can you see this nice uh, and long uh, textual uh, commercial ad? This is from uh, Neva magazine, uh, published in September 1911, when Webster reached Krasnoyarsk. And introduce, this text introduces uh, Russians to the concept of Indian tea and Ceylon tea, uh, suggesting that Russian connoisseurs of tea might be interested and might eventually appreciate the high quality of Assam tea and uh, other Ceylon teas, which are so popular recently, became, became so popular recently in England, right? So this is uh, this is the economic 
uh, context of uh, Mr. Webster's activities. And of course, as Sergei mentioned, he was not the first time in Russia. He was not expecting to find bears with balalaikas on, on streets. Uh, uh, and whatever was on his mind, he was he been there before and he was he knew what he was doing. The uh, uh, idea that somehow in the middle of the country you can allow on board three political uh, essentially prisoners, even though, though they were exiles, but they were convicts, and let, uh, get them out of the country um, uh, by the hundreds of thousands of miles along the in the in Russian territorial waters. I mean, it's mind boggling. Uh, whether he was uh, part of the like John Grafton uh, political uh, revolutionary affair or not, uh, clearly Webster was not uh, just an adventurist. Uh, he was a successful businessman, as his uh, litigation with his initial business partner shows that he he actually really invested in building a successful selling tea empire and promoting it. Uh, so uh, whatever he was doing in Russia, he knew what he was doing there. Uh, my question to uh, uh, Alexander Turbin continues my inquiry address to Sergei Glebov uh, concerning the intersection of race and class that he dodged successfully uh, after his uh, presentation. And I, I uh, uh, suggest uh, allowing a, a thought experiment. Uh, what if uh, these entrepreneurs in Vladivostok were uh, Chinese. I mean, uh, back in the day, there were just two, two, pro, or three of uh, people of same such caliber. Then uh, Yon Hojan that you mentioned. Uh, but what if the China was not the China of the day, but modern day China with capital, with integrated uh, entrepreneurs? I wonder whether the lines of race. Uh, the, the separation of between Europeans and uh, this, uh, Orientals were well, they they uh, the same as an actual story. Uh, had uh, these Chinese entrepreneurs be uh, this for, uh, Chinese presence was was uh, prevalently uh, embodied not by these uh, laborers, men or laborers, but by businessmen in. Uh, Britonian suits and, and, and the like, speaking English and Russian uh, Yale graduates. And to Timur Valetov, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, I wonder why opting for monetary value uh, representation of, of the trade, uh, di di uh, ignoring uh, the volume, uh, right, uh, Marina? Uh, um, and this is where computers are important besides Excel database. Uh, somehow weighting uh, this monetary value by volume. It's a long 19th century. Uh, in, the course of the, in the course of the 19th century, industrialization uh, took place. Uh, cereal uh, prices went up and down. And in, in the late 19th century, the, there was the such, such thing as agricultural crisis with uh, depreciation of uh, or overproduction of grain. Uh, due to uh, Argentina and United States exports. Think about the past 25 uh, years in Russian uh, economic history and the uh, fluctuation of oil prices. Looking at the value of uh, oil uh, export by Russian Federation, uh, just by uh, at, at the value of export, even in, in the, the share, uh, monetary share, share in Russian exports, uh, you would uh, probably greatly uh, inflate the actual uh, production of oil, even if, if it was actually growing. But the prices that went up uh, almost tenfold uh, obscure the actual dynamics. Uh, and the actual, what's important for your argument, the actual share of oil nowadays or industrial production 19th century in the overall uh, export volume. And second question, uh, I'm, uh, I noticed already this new trend in, uh, in, in Russian historiography that positioned itself as, uh, as, as uh, quantitative, uh, positivist, uh, fact-based, uh, is uh, 
complete ignoring of uh, historiography. I wonder how you position your study vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russian and Soviet, uh, Soviet economic tradition, starting from Tugan Baranovsky and to Milov and academician uh, uh, Kowalczynka. Uh, what's, what's your contribution to this tradition? Thank you. Thank you. Um, next in line is Chen Su. Thank you, Alexander. So uh, thank you very much to all three presenters for your papers. And my question, my first question is for Timor. Um, and I am, I find your charts very uh, illuminating. And I, I want to focus on the last two that you showed, which um, describe the uh, export of process goods and uh, processed uh, material, material and finished goods. So um, I was wondering, and I know this is a lot of work and I don't know if your sources will allow you to do that, but I wonder if you could break down these charts further to show the destination of these various exports. And the reason I ask is because there are different kinds of exports, they go to different places. And some of the exports go to Europe and some of the go exports go to Central Asia or East Asia. And the kind of exports that go to Europe, such as butter, as we know from David Darrell's paper, um, seem to be more competitive based on quality. So they can compete with other products from elsewhere in the world. Then there are the products that go to Central Asia or East Asia, they seem to go there because of proximity. So in other words, they're probably not globally competitive. So I'm wondering if you start breaking down the destination of these exports, you start to see a different picture of, of the kind of industrial and process production that uh, the Russian empire is improving. Is it, is it that it is, is producing? Is it that uh, after the 1860s, 1870s, Russia, the Russian empire is beginning to produce um, goods that are becoming more and more globally competitive? Or is it that despite the increased volume of export, in many cases, uh, the Russian empire is still acting a little bit like the colonial supplier to the European metropole? So that's my question for Timor. Thank you. And yeah. my question- oh, my you have to, oh, you have to, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I, but I, I you need to, to, to bear in mind that there are other questions and we want the answers. So please. <laughs> okay, so my next question is for Alexander Turbin. Turbin, and it's about what you're saying that there are diff different kinds of discourses about national belonging uh, one is nationalistic and the other one is Siberian regionalist. And I want, wonder if you can explain a little bit more what you mean by nationalist discourse. And I wonder about that because there are many, I think what exactly is a nation, what is national identity is a very, very uh, complex issue in the Russian empire, particularly because of this idea of Gosudarsianist which refers to an idea of national identity that is multi-ethnic, as opposed to an idea of Russian nationalism that is focused on Russian, ethnic Russian identity. So which is it that, you know, um, that you're really referring to? Because the two, a kind of multi-ethnic con concept of Gosudarsvianist is somehow lives in tension with the a, a more ethnic, ethnocentric idea of Russian nationalism. And, um, and so I wonder if you could um, talk about whether there is a distinction in your nationalist discourse, there's in fact a further distinction between ethnocentric nationalist discourse and a statist multi-ethnic idea of nationalism. 
And then when you talk about racialist ideas, maybe a, the racialist discourse can intersect with both the ethnocentric and the status idea of national identity. The reason I ask this is because at the end of your paper and in your presentation, you talk about the boundary of um, national political belonging and pose in opposition the idea of citizenship against that of uh, subjecthood. And I think you imply that citizenship um, suggests inclusiveness, subjecthood, something exclusionary. But the reason I bring this up is because in fact, citizenship can be rather, concepts of citizenship can be fairly exclusionary depending on whether it's based on an idea of civic identity, which is not ethnically focused or ethnic identity. So you can have a civic uh, citizenship or an ethnic folk, eth ethnic centered citizenship, right? So that's, um, this is something that Roger Brubaker talked about, citizenship of the soil versus citizenship of blood. So I just wonder if you could explore that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Next in line is Marina Loskutova. Uh, excuse me, I have forgotten to unmute myself. Well, I do have a question to Timur Valetov. Well, of course, uh, this is, uh, I do appreciate that this is an enormous amount of work that has been done and it's, it's, it's very handy. Uh, but at the same time, I sort of share the same question that uh, Sereja Glebov has already voiced. Uh, what, what are the overarching questions that we are trying to answer with these uh, very useful graphs? Um, because um, I mean, I'm um, doing doing research in forestry. Uh, of course, I'm very intrigued uh, with with the fate of of the crude products. Uh, and um, in a way, uh, I, I'm trying. I mean, um, the way how you classify the, 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 these products, it is not very helpful, really, for for understanding. Um, the, the the key pro the key processes that happen in the 19th century, for example, well, all sorts of, of forest products, uh, timber and non-timber forest products. So uh, I would suggest that perhaps uh, we uh, we are dealing here, in fact, with. Um, that uh, the, the, uh, the general fate of these crude products is closely related to the fate of pre-industrial technologies in Europe and with new industrial chemical technologies in particular. Uh, so I wonder uh, what, whether it makes sense, for example, to classify potash as a processed good as a processed item, all the, the technology of uh, potash production was, uh, was rather similar and not particularly capital intensive. While, for example, tar and pitch go to crude products, while in fact, you know, extracting tar from, from, uh, from forests was, was also, well, I mean, typologically, it's not awfully different from, uh, from potash uh, uh, production. Uh, the fate, uh, well, is about the fate of animal fat. It certainly had to be related to to the to the rise of the stearine making industry in, in Western Europe, and then with the rapid um, coming of the gas lighting, and later on with with electricity. So, the, all uh, you, you can understand the fates of all these goods. Only if you understand the uh, the broader technological processes at work. So in this case, I wonder whether it makes sense to group them to lump them all together. So I wonder what what are the overarching questions that your classification is is able to answer. That's that's my question. Thank you. But 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 the graphs are are, are absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Marina. Um, uh, Chuck Steinwedel, next in line. Hey, thanks for a uh, set of very interesting papers. I have um, a couple questions for Alexander Turbin. 
Um, I think that you do an excellent job of showing uh, these German or former German subjects, now subjects of the, uh, the Tsar, in their local context in the Far East. That is their place in local society, their role as um, entrepreneurs or tradespeople, merchants. I was wondering if, if I could push you to um, look at a bit of a broader context. Um, and that I would I have in mind two dimensions. The first is to what extent do these Europeans in the Far East bring their own ideologies and agendas? Um, I, I think you make clear that they certainly have an interest in promoting uh, the Porto Franco because they need free trade in order to function. But do they bring with them other racial ideologies, other um, kind of economic uh, priorities or references to European based uh, ideas of free trade? Um, uh, I think that that would only enrich, um, I think, your story if, you, if they do. Uh, and I think partially I have in mind the, the racial and the, you know, the German ideas, or at least a certain German idea of race that's developing at about the same time. Um, the other context would be if you could, I know this isn't your project, but if you could give us a brief, uh, either here in your further research, uh, a comparative uh, analysis or at least a depiction of, of Germans, um, foreigners, uh, European foreigners in the Far East. Um, I can only imagine, I don't know, um, but uh, to what extent do you see similar activity in China? That is Germans uh, setting up merchant operations, trading um, and having a certain kind of local role. Um, not that this is going to be your focus, but I think it would help us sort of situate the rush, the processes at work in the Russian empire a bit more broadly um, and only give it more kind of explanatory power. Um, for Timur Valietov, I certainly, uh, I, I found fascinating your graphs. I think this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that, um, it's not what I do, but I'm glad you're doing it um, because I think it's essential. The one thing I wanted to encourage you to do, or perhaps um, you can help us understand this connection between the economic and the political, that's uh, a theme uh, of our, our conference. That is, when you look at these classificatory schemes as they evolve in the yearbooks, to what extent do they change and why? Who's suggesting different classifications? Are they, are they trying to imitate European um, ways of classifying trade? Uh, are they developing their own? Do they have a political agenda in reclassifying things a certain way? And I realize, uh, looking at your paper, that, that you do have a reference to previous work that sounds like it might bear on this subject, and I have not yet consulted that, so forgive me if you've uh, described it there. It's a citation one on your paper. But I was just wondering if you could um, offer uh, an observation that sort of would help us connect political agendas with both the trade statistics and perhaps also the larger trade patterns. I realize that's a whole can of worms, but thank you for your paper. Uh, Benjamin Borle. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I uh, will limit myself to one question to Alexander Turbin. Uh, I was wondering if, if I'm not, if I didn't miss anything, you didn't mention religion. So I was wondering if, if the fact that uh, most of these uh, German merchants uh, or uh, Kunst and Albers were Protestants, if that played any role in the discourses you're investigating, or is that just irrelevant? Thank you very much. Um, and I have a very quick point last in line and we'll give it back to Alexander Turbin. And, and I, I would like you to still think about this category of German and European um, in the Russian imperial and local regional Far Eastern um, uh, context, because um, the fact that they are in resettling at the time um, the German empire is created uh, and they're living in Vladivostok when Hamburg is reintegrated on a very different basis than it used to, to the German empire. I, you know, I think many things sort of German uh, German change um, uh, and what what did it mean to 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 be German or to fashion yourself German or to be perceived as German uh, has changed and and in the end what what I find interesting too 
that uh, they do accept uh, subjecthood. Um, and one, again, one sort of uh, thing that, I, that I'm thinking about as I try to interpret why in the end they do it is that maybe their economic connections are beyond the region. I understand that you're focusing on the region, but maybe they are uh, integrated into the economic um, sort of context in the empire. And one thing that you can't do without subjecthood is to get the court rank. And the court rank, you know, you show them and, and you know, they, they're representing it. It's another status uh, in deals in, in um, you know, we know all about the Camarilli and other things. So I'll just, I just invite you to, to still work on why do they accept uh, uh, naturalize and why, and what does that change in, in this local connection? So without any further ado, we have a um, uh, good uh, six, uh, seven minutes uh, for each uh, presenter left, uh, and we should proceed in the order of the presentation. So, Alexandra Gopcharov. Okay, so, uh, dear colleagues, thank you for the uh, wonderful questions. Actually, I was anticipating some of them uh, in connection with the uh, title of the paper, which is a, a bit kind of provoking uh, and asking for, uh, for a discussion all by itself. So, uh, so I'll try to uh, kind of go in order, and uh, if I miss uh, something, then I'm uh, sorry. Maybe uh, I can answer to it later. So, uh, so uh, it was a, a good uh, summary of the uh, of my paper uh, from Sergei, uh, and uh, there is this problem with uh, uh, which I've encountered during my studies of the. Uh, uh, history of the Northern Sea, uh, particularly in the age of uh, uh, the uh, of the uh, late 19th, uh, early 20th century, and uh, it is uh, primarily connected with the fact that uh, it is tended to rationalize uh, all activity on the Northern Sea. If we, however, look uh, at the separate expeditions and the maritime companies that were established throughout the 19th century and uh, earliest 20th century. So uh, basically, uh, until we arrive at uh, Jonas Leeds, uh, Siberian steaming uh, steamship company, which was kind of uh, which was more rational to uh, to to all extent because uh, what we did was he made a detailed analysis of the Siberian market. Uh, he uh, proposed and started realizing further on uh, the export of Siberian uh, sawed uh, timber. So the first uh, to actually do that, uh, that even though there there were propositions before. Uh, as for uh, Webster and. Uh, uh, and himself. So I uh, would strongly, and I'm going to answer to uh, a number of uh, comments uh, in this one statement. I strongly disagree that, uh, and we can see from his activities uh, that there was uh, a very big rationalization behind his behavior and his, this expedition of his. Uh, yes, it is tempting to, to say, and of course to uh, speculate that uh, well, being uh, a successful uh, businessman, entrepreneur, being a successful uh, tea planter, uh, being a successful uh, distributor uh, and early marketer of Cylon Tea uh, in, uh, in cooperation with Thomas Lipton. Yes, uh, this is true. He was successful in this. But uh, then if we uh, look at other schemes, which were, uh, we don't have to even, we can go back into history and look at the Darien scheme, for example, and um, which was a total disaster uh, back in the uh, 18th century. But as for uh, Webster, it seems that he wasn't really uh, interested in the, uh, I would say uh, financial outcome of his, uh, his expedition because uh, what happened in 1911 was that uh, the expedition was a finance, financial disaster. So he lost more money than he made. And it wasn't just more money, he lost a lot of money. Uh, and nonetheless, he tried to repeat uh, the same uh, scheme uh, well, at least he proposed repeating it. Unfortunately for him, he died and was unable to do that. I speculate that because of his death, maybe if, because he had some deteriorating health conditions, he couldn't continue. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he made no further effort 
uh, in continuing the scheme. But uh, uh, he came up with some ideas, and they are, we can see them in the documents proposed to the Russian uh, uh, Ministry of Trade and uh, of Commerce and Industry, uh, where he uh, has a, a, a novel scheme of uh, trading whatsoever. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he, as his predecessors, uh, particularly Wiggins and the uh, British companies, uh, which were active uh, throughout the 19th century, uh, they are very, uh, I wouldn't say that they are uh, too uh, keen on uh, studying the Siberian market, and basically they're failures as businesses. So they, what they're trying to do is they're trying to come uh, into Siberia, sell something uh, at a quick price, uh, at a uh, as fast as possible, get the profit, and then disappear. So and uh, every single failure, be it a little disaster or just a loss of a ship, basically leads to the termination of the whole scheme. So uh, and. Uh, there were a number of these companies. The, uh, the, the, the last British company that was active before um, Webster had a chance to begin was uh, Labour and Popham's company. Uh, uh, and uh, one disaster basically led to the termination of, uh, of the whole scheme. So uh, it, it's actually a question of whether how detailed the British uh, went into this. And I discussed this in my dissertation in, uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, uh, actually, there wasn't much of a detail. So they weren't working on the infrastructure, uh, so uh, they weren't working on developing uh, the sea route itself, they weren't working on developing new vessels, so basically they weren't doing anything, they were just using the route they were coming in and uh, behaving, that's why I coined them the merchant adventurers, and actually uh, they coined themselves merchant adventurers because one of the companies was the Phoenix Merchant Adventurers of Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, well, it just called itself the way, uh, uh, basically copying a, a, the name of a company which existed back in the uh, uh, late uh, 1600s. So uh, early 1600s, I'm sorry, in, in Newcastle about the time. Uh, so uh, so uh, there was the question uh, from David ab about merchant adventures. What is this? So uh, colonialism, yes, to some extent colonialism, but colonialism of the, uh, I would say, the back to the Tudor era. So it wasn't really bent on uh, somehow uh, making a colony in Siberia. So of course, uh, Webster to this extent understood that there was uh, some kind of territorial possession to the Russian Empire. But uh, uh, as far as I can remember, Ilya was asking uh, that uh, whether uh, he knew what he was doing when he was uh, smuggling the uh, uh, exiles from Siberia. Well, um, they were exiled and we have the uh, uh, documents proving that they were exiled. And uh, there was actually not much control uh, of what was going on in the Arctic and uh, claiming uh, claimants to uh, territories in Russian, uh, what today is uh, the Russian Arctic began somewhat later. So uh, back in the, uh, in the uh, 1910s, uh, not many countries acknowledged that uh, uh, the uh, islands and the seas bordering Siberia were actually Russian to that extent. There were just waters you could just sail or venture into. The question was whether you could sell things uh, uh, paying a levy or not paying a levy, or, or whether you could sell them at all. So, and as for the uh, question about weapons, so Alexander, uh, I'm very sorry. Just very short to this one because we need to hear. From yes, us. of course, I understand, uh, Alexander. Just very short. Uh, as for the weapons, so uh, though we can uh, deem Leeds' uh, report biased, but uh, basically what uh, Webster is doing, he's uh, playing the uh, kind of the. Uh, leather stockings idea. And I, I put this in my article. So just bringing in weapons, let's sell them to the Siberians and get some sable furs. So I wouldn't, uh, so, so so I understand the uh, desire to rationalize the whole idea, but uh, in my opinion, it was a merchant adventuring enterprise. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are limited. And so I have to, to make sure the shares are distributed. So uh, Alexander Turbin. All right, uh, do you hear me? Uh, so thank you very much for this bunch of wonderful questions. Uh, so first one uh, came from the Sergei Glebov. Uh, uh, 
about the possibility of uh, uh, existence of uh, uh, alternative to the overall imperial uh, overall imperial alternative to the nationalizing language. Uh, first of all, I think like uh, when posing questions such a way, it seems that like for example, regionalist discourse is supposed to be uh, not as fitting to, 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 to such a language which could uh, describe empire uh, and like as, as something which could could, could exist as, as a whole. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, like that regionalist discourse is all described in it in, 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 in some terms as something uh, separate. It still uh, had the potential as, as a described in the political space. Uh, as united as well. Uh, next, uh, uh, I think that uh, when we think about uh, nationalizing language itself, I think it has this potential. When in, in, in my paper, I, I speak about this constant redefinitions of the Russian interests, Russian trade, etc. It seems that uh, like, uh, yeah, I mean, nationalizing language and like nationalistic rhetoric, very much it is our construct, right? Which we, uh, try to use for, for our research agenda. And in, in this sense, it, uh, it, it unites many competing, competing attempts to uh, describe structurally diverse uh, social political space. And, 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 and I think just when, when we speak about one nationalizing language, we still may deconstruct it. Um, then, I'm moving to the Ilya Gerasimov's uh, uh, question, and like uh, he, he asked about uh, uh, what if what if those prosperous interpreters were Chinese? Uh, would, 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 would racial discourse change? So he offered uh, a thought experiment, and my answer would be Yes and no, but mostly yes. <laughs> this, once we once we go for thought experiment, we actually try to embrace an immense possible pasts, right? And, uh, and, and, and in this sense, uh, it is not just about only and, and this issue like of who were those particular merchants is just one uh, one small issue in the whole bunch of discourses which uh, are intertwined and like created this uh, background, discursive background that informed the discussions. So for sure, like uh, it really depends on many other variables and like, yes, uh, racial markers like could have been used one way and like they could be used another way as well. Like, so in, in this sense, like uh, I, 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 I would be on the constructivist standpoint that we can easily imagine uh, another situation where uh, the racial categories wouldn't uh, play out as they did in this story. So next question from Che Yun Su uh, about two types of discourses. Uh, uh, as, I tried in my. I don't. I'm not sure if I uh, marked a uh, uh, regionalist discourse as nationalistic one in the paper and in my speech. At least, uh, if I did, it is it is a mistake because uh, I suppose regionalist language to be quite different uh, in a way how it worked. Uh, and, and in in the first part, when I speak about two nationalistic. Projects, for example, it is more about uh, uh, two visions uh, on on the Far East and Siberia, like uh, or old old uh, nationalistic vision under the official nationality of Nicholas the First, and like another nationalistic project, like uh, uh, of so to say progressive nationalists. And when speaking about uh, nationalistic rhetoric, to which I refer, uh, well. I don't know. For example, when looking at Katkov, uh, uh, I think he mostly in his speculations he tried to follow this logic of uh, governmental nationalism. But actually, very uh, very often uh, he was switching between different registers, right? Because in his rhetoric, we can both see the 
uh, often switch to ethnic, ethnic categories, to religious issues, etc. So it is it is always quite uh, intertwined and complicated. Uh, next about citizenship, subjected and political belonging. Oh, uh, yes, for sure. Uh, I, my work is very much inspired by Rogers Brubaker and his uh, uh, writings on the simultaneous logic of inclusion and exclusion. The reason why I use political belonging, prefer to use it, is because I find out that like uh, when I try to speak about citizenship subjected boundary, quite often uh, people perceive it as just uh, just concentrate on the legal perspective. While I think that uh, nowadays, and like for example, when we look at the Sergei Glebov's work on on the issues of expertise, it is much wider question. Uh, but this here it is rather personal choice. Uh, Alexander, so one minute. Okay, Professor Stanvidal's questions uh, about uh, uh, Europeans bringing ideas. Uh, for sure, this is important, but why I try to use it uh, to, to speak about it. But also, uh, I always cautious about this because I think. Uh, Russians also, like many, many Russians were also very much included in those global uh, exchange of ideas. So sometimes it's very complicated to, to understand, uh, is, it, is it really some specificity? Uh, and like about China, thank you, it is, it is a good insight. Uh, question about religion. Oh uh, yes, it affected, but you know, many, many Germans of the Russian origin were there in the region and it uh, complicated the picture. Uh, Alexander Semyonov's question uh, about German and Alexander, Europe. I'm very sorry. We need to give it to Timur Valetov. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have, unfortunately, time to answer all the questions, but, but at least uh, those that you want to disagree uh, or um, sort of really think it's important. Uh, Timur Valetov, it's on to you. Uh, thank you. I, I would like first to, to thank the organizers, uh, the panel, uh, uh, two other presenters uh, for this bright uh, panel, and uh, uh, all of you for your attention and uh, your questions. I, uh, I have got many questions and uh, I'm not sure I can answer all of them, but uh, I will try to mail you if you are not against uh, with uh, uh, rather full answers. Um, what I really need to answer now is uh, the question which was double or maybe triple. Uh, why do we need uh, all this job? Uh, well, I have um, three answers for this. First, uh, this is because uh, the statistical um, uh, history of Russian foreign trade uh, is not written yet. Uh, there, were, there is a huge literature. There were many bright uh, specialists, uh, both historians and experts on foreign trade uh, of different decades. Uh, writing on different topics, uh, but mostly they were focused on uh, their own uh, thematics, maybe on the special decade, maybe on the special uh, product, maybe on the special direction. And uh, it is, I think, necessary to construct uh, the, uh, the complex uh, history of this. Uh, by the way, I, I hope uh, I will sometimes uh, trace it into the Soviet period, but it is much more complicated. Well, um, the second uh, part of my uh, answer is, uh, why do we need uh, the historical statistics and the quantitative uh, history of foreign trade? Uh, uh, Sergei Glebov uh, told uh, uh, correctly that it is possible to say, well, the expert was mainly uh, cereal, maybe mainly grain, and that's all. Yes, 
This is the major character of the Russian foreign uh, trade for the uh, second half of the period. But many researchers are interested in other uh, topics of, uh, uh, of the process. And uh, if we ask what was more important, butter or oil, uh, it is necessary to look to the complex of the data series uh, I would like to provide. Um, the statistics is not a history. It is just uh, a method to, uh, to find uh, the clue points of the history. And uh, we can dispute about the peak, but it is necessary to see the peak before. And it is absolutely impossible without constructing the data series and these graphs where we see the peaks. Um, and the third uh, part of the answer is uh, that uh, I have provided the data series and, uh, and placed part of it uh, online uh, already. And uh, I will uh, continue this uh, job. And uh, it is open access. And it is possible for you to come and to see uh, to see the graphs, to see, to see the tables, and to change uh, my structure, extracting tar or potash or uh, animal fat or adding something uh, and to, to build uh, your own graphs. Well, uh, for now, briefly, very briefly for other uh, questions, if I have three more minutes, do I? Maybe uh, two, because <laughs> the time is officially up, but maybe okay, two minutes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, so I can just, I promise to, to, write, uh, to write you. Uh, thank you very much. That's all, I think. Thank you yes. very much, Timur, um, and other Thank you. Then I give, um, it, I give it to Sergei, and I want uh, to thank all the panelists, and especially Alexander Turbin, who gave answers to the questions at 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, everyone. This was an interesting conversation, and uh, we are um, uh, getting together tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Moscow time, and we are moving into the early um, uh, Soviet, uh, well, uh, not even so early um, Soviet period um, to discuss the same kinds of issues. Um, so I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank goodbye. you. And goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.